The following program was funded by the Barataria Terrebonne National Estuary Program, U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and the Louisiana Department of Environmental Quality. Two centuries ago, here on Grand Terre Island, America's most famous buccaneer, Jean Lafitte, maintained precarious command over his fellow smugglers and pirates. The lure of their buried plunder still compels fortune seekers. But the true treasure of these wetlands is not buried under this soggy earth. The treasure we must rescue is this land itself, these waters and their living resources. It's pretty good life out here. A good time. We made a pretty good drag there. I guess we got about, uh, about 30 or 35. I like to cast net, and especially when I catch a lot of them. West from the mouth of the Mississippi River lies an enormous tangle of wetlands and waterways known as the Barataria Tarbone Estuary. When you say an estuary, this is an estuary. This is the lower end of an estuary. You have a barrier island right to our right. This is a large bay. From here you have lakes, and marshes, swamps, bayous. An estuary is, is really the end result of all the processes that have taken place over thousands of years. The river spilling over, sedimenting all the nutrients that are released, the plants that grow there, the salt water comes in from the bay. These interact, start life forces, the uh, plants in the water, the small animals, the larger fish. In Louisiana, you can't really live without estuaries. Barataria Terrebonne is home to 600,000 people, but perhaps not for very much longer. My old grandfather told me they dug this with a shovel. This canal right here to get through to the Gulf, it was dug with a shovel to get a, a, a pirog through years back. And look what it is now. And just keep on washing and washing and winding it out. Because uh, like out here, there probably won't be no more land right here. It'll be uh, all water. No other spot on Earth is disappearing as quickly as Barataria Tarbone. A half acre of coastal wetland turns into open water every 15 minutes. Since 1950, an area as big as the entire state of Delaware has washed into the sea and the dire process continues. These endangered wetlands are a treasure whose immense value can be measured ecologically, culturally, and economically. For instance, they support a harvest of over half a billion pounds of fish and shellfish every year, making Barataria Tarbonne the nursery to 20% of America's coastal seafood catch. It's the only thing that makes me feel important. Signing the check. <laughs> but as far as shrimping, every year the saltwater intrusion goes further and the shrimp gets further. Eventually it'll, they'll be trolling in dividend. The marsh means a lot to me. It's my living. I mean, it's, it's my living, it's their living. It's uh, everybody on Bayou Lafouche's living, just like every bayou in South Louisiana. The same thing, no marsh, no live. But harvesting resources is not just a business, it's a way of life. When you see ducks way up in the sky, you give them a couple of quacks. And they, they hear that, and you start the feeding call. It's a hand feeding, down they come. I've seen them do this, so I know they do it. You go wherever there is a healthy marsh and you'll have ducks by the thousands, even today. 
flock after flock after flock after flock, going to the, to the marsh. Thousands of them. They're going there in that marsh. We've got to have that marsh. Sportsmen are not the only ones who await the annual bird migrations. There are people from, from all over the country, the U.S., uh, and really all over the world that, that come down just to see these birds. And uh, it, it, the numbers of these birds, it's phenomenal. They're just <laughs> everywhere you look. And some trees look like Christmas trees. There's yellow birds and blue birds. They're coming from South America in the springtime. This is the first land they see after they cross the Gulf of Mexico. They stop here, they're very tired, they need food, they need water. The birds gorge themselves on the mulberries, the wild mulberries. You'll see a solid yellow bird with purple drippings down his chest and he's up in the mulberry tree just, just eating as fast as he can. Tourists come to Barataria Tarbone to see not just birds, but also other unusual inhabitants. I hope that uh, when my grandkids and my great-grandkids are grown, they can actually come out and show you one of these turtles. There'll be some left. That's what I'm hoping for. Yeah. Now this fella here, this one here is 100 years old or better, well over 100 pounds. He's not a mean turtle, though. <laughs> he won't bite much, see? But this fella, they said 100 pounds, but I don't know. Either I'm getting old or he's getting fat. <laughs> the swamp tours bring in gas, hotel, bed and breakfast, restaurant. Well, they bring in money for everybody, really. Our job is very easy right now because all we have to do is spotlight our natural beauty of our area. And that's what people want to see. And we'll show them the shrimp boats. We'll show them our seafood industry. We can show them the swamp by boat, we can show it by air, we can show it by car, any way they want to see it. These are the things they're trying to experience, things that are unique and have never really uh, crossed their path before. Come on, come on, Troy. Come on. Uh -uh, come on. When uh, we first opened this place, um, we didn't have any alligators. Now, you got people from Germany, Sweden, France that drive in here. You got alligator, no alligator. See you later. Come on, Troy. Come on up here. If you don't have a gator, they walk off. Come on, Troy. I've seen them turn in the on, drive as soon as you say no gator. Come on. And if tourists leave if there are no alligators, what if we lose our swamps and marshes? Barataria Terrebonne's wetlands make it uniquely suited to profit from the growing industry of ecotourism. Scenic beauty may be the ultimate renewable resource, but the estuary's other riches continue to draw visitors as well. This is the best fishing in the world. I just had guests leaving from Houston. They, they have fished in a lot of places and they've never seen anything like this. We fished inland one day and caught specks and reds. Today we went offshore and caught ling, we caught bull dolphin, we caught amberjack, we caught uh, wahoo. So, uh, in a matter of the two days they were here, they had more species of fish than I think they had ever caught in their life, and left with a sampling of all of it. I use the word horn of plenty, and I tell them about how plentiful the seafood is down here, and uh, a lot of uh, the people up there are very envious. A lot of them can't really comprehend it either. He puts a crab boil uh, on and uh, shoot in 15 minutes, we've got enough stuff out of waist deep water to feed an army. Uh, you can't get that back in Ohio where I'm from. Jump against the waves and go under and stuff like that. Oh, we like the hermit crabs. There's hermit crabs in here. Hermie. <laughs> and she has one in a container at home. We have a whole bunch of it. Mine's probably away. And we caught some sand crabs and most of them died, but <laughs> one of them went over um, Aunt Mary's toe. Marshes and swamps also act as natural filters for pollution. The swamps, the marshes, it's kind of like a big filter, a sponge that all the, the stuff flows through. And as it flows through, a lot of it's picked up and used as food. 
it's uh, metabolized out before it can get into the larger areas where we produce our shellfish and, and oysters and crabs. As wetlands protect us from mankind's often invisible toxic threats, the same marshes can also save us from nature's most dramatic danger, hurricanes. Each mile of estuary you have between a city and a storm surge decreases the amount of water you have by a foot. So if you have 10, 10 miles of estuaries protecting the West Bank of New Orleans, you'd have 10 feet less of storm surge from a major storm. If you didn't have that, you'd have 10 feet of water in your house. And it's not just homes that wetlands shelter from the wind and waves. Loop is the Louisiana offshore oil port. It's this nation's only oil port capable of handling the super tankers. Loop is handling currently about 10 to 15 percent of the nation's oil. So any shutdown in Loop would have an immediate impact, not only locally, not only to the state, but to the nation. The wetlands help protect uh, the infrastructure, and Loop is part of it. There's been a rejuvenation of oil and gas activity, and we're actually in a boom now. Uh, people are predicting that the oil and gas reserves south of here are going to exceed Prudhoe Bay, Alaska, which is in the billions of barrels. The truck traffic has increased tremendously because of this, this deep water activity, and we're, our records show we're handling 52,000 trucks a month on this highway. The more coastal erosion reduces the amount of marsh, which protects the road system, uh, you know, the greater vulnerability you have. If the highways goes, the port goes. As diverse as the ways we use this fertile, fragile ecosystem are the people who work so hard to tap its riches. French-speaking Cajuns. Anglo-Americans and African-Americans. Native Americans of the Homa tribe. And Vietnamese Americans still in their first generation here. But the ecosystem that supports all these people, this vibrant, varied economy, these recreational opportunities, such natural bounty and cultural legacy, is under stress. The big problem is subsidence. We don't have any rocks here in Louisiana. These are soft sediments that have been deposited by the Mississippi River over the last six to 7,000 years. Organic matter is still decomposing. The water is still being squeezed out, and so the sediments are still compacting, and that results in subsidence of the surface. Subsidence does happen naturally, but also um, with the rivers overflowing every year like they used to do, you'd have something that would mitigate that. As if the land was going down from the weight of the sediments, you'd also have building from the, uh, the natural processes of sediments flowing over every year. And now you don't have that, that check and balance. You just have the negatives of the subsidence, the erosion, the uh, the saltwater intrusion, and all those together combined for, to break up your marsh, you lose your, your estuary area, and you lose your productivity. When we alter the hydrology of a marsh, is that when we build canals and things, or when we built a lot of canals in the 50s and the 60s, we used to just take the material out of the canal and put it on the marsh next to the canal. And so we build both a canal and a dredge material levee right next to the canal. If you've got a canal with a levee next to it, the sediments can't get into the marsh behind the levee because they can't flow over the top of the levee. We can cause enormous problems, both because water, when it gets there, stays there for a long time, and because the natural tidal movement can't get sediment in there anymore. And so any kind of plant like this that's sitting on the marsh surface, as the land subsides, that gets flooded more and more often. And although these plants can tolerate a certain amount of flooding, there's a limit to what they're adapted to. And if they get flooded too much, then they die, and plants dying is coastal land loss. In Barataria Terrebonne, Lands that natural forces alone would have taken a thousand years to destroy have instead disappeared in a single lifetime. With the loss of wetlands, as grasslands become open water, or as salt water intrudes into freshwater ecosystems, habitat is lost for the wildlife which, seasonally like these coots, or permanently like these pelicans, call these marshes home. 
the nurseries for fish and shellfish, the acreages necessary to buffer storm energy and absorb the runoff from human activity is reduced. But coastal erosion is not the only problem. Whenever people exceed fish and game limits or introduce exotic species such as this voracious nutria or these water hyacinths which clog bayous, they reduce the size and diversity of native populations. Urban and agricultural runoff contributes to eutrophication. Such oxygen depletion sometimes kills fish in the Gulf of Mexico's so-called dead zone. Poorly treated human wastes foster disease-producing organisms. Accidental spills and illegal dumping poison wildlife and birds, fish and shellfish, plants and people. I don't see no future in this for my kids. None at all. <laughs> if you lose your car, you'd have to walk, huh? If you lose your marsh, you're gonna lose everything. Marsh is gone, you're not gonna have nothing left no more. That's how it is. No future for That's why I said the road is gone. Our seafood industry is gone. It ain't what it used to be. Really the challenge to the next generation is trying to deal with the wetlands, trying to deal with wetlands that don't have a sediment source, that are subsiding rapidly. I think you talk to the economists, they always say the idea is a retreat, we can't do anything, are really not viable. But they, they say it's always cheaper to do something than nothing. We're never going to get back to the way it was. We never had the production we had in the 50s and 70s. We can't get it all back. We can rescue some. We can do a lot to help, you know, help the processes that put all this here for us. Any solution that we apply to the kinds of problems we have in Barataria Terrebonne needs to be at the same kind of scale as the problem. And we know that we're losing about 20 square miles a year of marsh. What we have to do is work with the natural processes that built the land to begin with. We're looking at rebuilding those wetlands. And we can do that. It's not impossible. We need to take some bold steps. Yes, it'll be expensive. But let's remember, one B-1 bomber was a billion dollars. We'll take two. How would we build up a new marsh in an area where a marsh had formed apart? If we were close to a riverine source of sediment like the Atchafalaya or the Mississippi River, we might be able to make a breach in the levee and let sediments move from the river into that open water area and gradually they would build up the water bottom to an elevation where plants could begin to grow. In its commitment to the health of the entire ecosystem, an effective restoration program mimics the natural processes that created the estuary. This golden rule means that we should address the overall problem of land loss instead of only offering piecemeal solutions. Most of all, we must recognize that bold restoration projects will have costs as well as benefits. Pouring in all this water for the public good so that we can protect the good of the estuaries for everybody in not only this state but in the United States. When you do that, a lot of oyster farmers, and some already, have been put out of business. But how does that one oyster farmer, or those few oyster farmers, or hundreds of oyster farmers, how do they get taken care of? If something ain't done with this erosion, we ain't gonna have oyster business. To get the dirt that's in the Mississippi River onto the marsh, you need to have enough water that's gonna that keep that, that dirt in suspension and transport it from the river to the areas that you need it. It's gonna take a significant amount of water to do that. There is no other sediment source, think about it. We can't run bulldozers and dump trucks from the north shore of Lake Pontchartrain to Barataria to rebuild Barataria. There's not that much dirt and there's not that much money. We need to use the process that built those marshes to rebuild those marshes. We have to do it in a fashion so that people can still live here, the oil and gas industry can still function, the fisheries industries can still function, and we can keep a sustainable wetland base to support some of those ecologically based industries. To help find common ground solutions, 
citizens and coastal restoration agencies came together under the umbrella of the Barataria Terrebonne National Estuary Program. They represented industry and environmentalists, fishermen and landowners, hunters and scientists. Over tens of thousands of hours, they accumulated data, created computer models, and commissioned the real-world tests that were necessary to ensure that the large-scale projects of the future will be effective. Meantime, many less costly short-term solutions have already been implemented. Planting cover crops to reduce runoff from fallow sugarcane fields. Beneficially using dredged and recycled material, including even secondhand Christmas trees, to add sediment to shallow open water, endangered marsh, or barrier island beaches. Plugging unused canals to create ponds for waterfowl and marsh animals and planting native vegetation, such as this beach grass, to anchor soil while protecting nesting habitat for brown pelicans and other birds. Above all, one thing in particular can help save the estuary, and that's your involvement. What we do as individuals makes a huge difference. Observe fish and game limits, adopt a beach or wetland for regular cleanup, and don't litter. Inspect and repair your home septic system. Minimize your use of lawn chemicals. Recycle. And be especially careful disposing of toxic materials. Report pollution to the appropriate enforcement agencies. Educate yourselves and your children about the Barataria Tarbone Estuary and the resources that make it the most valuable estuary in America. You pay taxes, right? You may not fish a day in your life, but if I tell you there's an industry that depends on those wetlands that generates a billion dollars to the state's economy every year, without that industry, it's gonna cost you a lot more in your own tax dollars to support the activities of the state. Oil and gas, all the structures that are inshore are designed to be inshore facilities. If you have no wetlands, you are no longer inshore. You're offshore. You need to redesign all of those facilities. So think about the millions and millions of dollars that that would cost. So let's say you're not interested in oil and gas. Where do you live? Do you live inside of a levee system? How high is that levee system? That's with 30 miles of wetlands in front of it to protect you. Remove those. Now let's talk about the size of the levee that needs to be there. Let's talk about the possibility of you being flooded because of a levee breach during a major storm. Yes, it's important to you whether you like to hunt and fish, whether you belong to the oil and gas, if you derive your living, you know, whether you live. It is important to you from a number of different perspectives. Well, it's definitely a treasure. I mean, we get billions of pounds of productivity. And it's not just food, it's all the wildlife that it supports, it's the way of living that it supports. It's people making a living off the land, you know, the way their fathers and grandfathers did. It's definitely a bountiful treasure. And the best thing about it is it's renewable. A lot of the effects that we see out here today are a result of what people's done to the system. So, you know, as we have to realize that and try to mitigate and counteract that and leave less of a footprint when we, we walk across the marsh. I think the important thing to understand when you look at our wetlands is that the change is in a lifetime. There are very few geologic processes you can see in a lifetime. In point of fact, the clock's still ticking. If we take an acre as about the size of a football field, Louisiana's losing a football field every 15 minutes, we are losing land dramatically and quickly and in people's lifetime. What they would lose, they would lose their, their whole, uh, but I'm concerned their, their history, their, their, their makeup. That's where they come from. Trappers, fishermen, hunters, if they lose that, they, they lost it all. When you lose your natural, your natural history, that's it. It's, it's something else. With current rates of land loss, each passing year leaves less to save. Rescuing the treasure will be a huge ongoing task, but it is essential if we are to preserve for the nation Barataria Tarbone's wealth in 
minerals, fisheries, culture, and wildlife habitat. From this earth we come, and into it we depart. This good earth is more than our responsibility. It is our home. It is our life. It is our future. You see, I got a small boat, but we got the camp, we make some extra money when we can. You know? so, <clears throat> like it? Oh, I love it. My oh, wife want me to stay home. Hey, what do you want me to stay home? Sit in an easy chair and die like that? No, no. I'll die at the camp or in a boat somewhere, not at the house. For more information about what you can do to help save this national treasure, Call or write the Barataria Terrebonne National Estuary Program, Post Office Box 2663, Thibodeau, Louisiana, 70310.